there, my wife. Okay, good morning. <laughs> Welcome to Bible class, Sunday morning Bible class. Uh, glad you're joining us this morning. Um, don't have any particular uh, announcements that I need to make as far as I know uh, right off this morning in class. Gary's going to have some announcements before our sermon this morning, so you want to be uh, on for that. Um, I do have a friend of mine. I've Ronnie Duncan, that is very serious with the virus in Tulsa and um, is intubated and is not doing very well, so I wish you would remember him and that family uh, in your prayers. He's a friend of mine, run a Duncan Tank service over in Okima for a lot of years. He's a good guy, but anyway, I wish you'd remember him in your prayers. Um, I don't think there's anything else, anybody. Do you know anything, Gary, particularly other than that I need to mention? Uh, we'll try to get everything announced. If there's announcements you need us to make for prayers or other things, if you'll send us a message on that before uh, the sermon, we will get that announced before the sermon. So make sure and let us know if there's things we need to mention. And we'll make sure and get that done. Glad you're here this morning. Going to be in Matthew chapter 9. Let's have a word of prayer before we start. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we're thankful for this day that you've given us. Uh, thankful for your word, Lord, and our ability to go in and look at it, that it might guide our lives and help us, Lord, to uh, understand your nature, understand your will, and ultimately your will for us and your will for your word in our lives. Pray that you would be with those, Lord, who are who are ill this morning that we don't necessarily know of, that are that have, and Lord, those in this congregation that have lost loved ones over the last couple of months, Lord, we pray that you continue to be with them. Let them know we have not forgotten them, that we remember them in our prayers. And we know that's a long process, Lord, and pray that you'd comfort them. Just thank for the blessings of this life of each other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're uh, kind of in Matthew this morning, but of course, synoptically, uh, Mark and Luke, there's a lot of synoptic input as far as different gospels. These aren't unique necessarily to Matthew. The way Matthew's got them arranged are a little different than in some other places. There's things you can always pick up by going to different gospels and looking at this, looking at this story from different different perspectives. There's always little tidbits that are mentioned in places that aren't mentioned in others. When we talked about the Legion, you know there's only one gospel, Matthew, that talks about the uh, him being clothed, uh, being in his right mind, and you know, being naked, then being clothed. So there's things we pick up. And Matthew, as we talk about the, uh, we call him Jairus' daughter. He's never really mentioned by name in the book of Matthew. So there's a little bit there that's a little bit different. Um, and some other things we'll talk about as we get down into this. And oftentimes when you look at stories in a synoptic sense across Gospels, you'll see variations, and you're like, well, is it the same story? Is it a different story? And in this case, we're going to talk about this morning, the blind men. Some people think that's what's called a doublet, that it's also mentioned in Matthew, and that it's re-mentioned in Matthew, and some people think it's a different story. So there's things that we look at, looking across Gospels, um, and that sometimes gets confusing. Chronologically, it gets confusing. Uh, where are we talking about? All Gospels don't run in a chronological sequence, so they get kind of, sometimes they're put into place to kind of make a point, but they're all evidences for us, and you have to understand that Gospel writers didn't necessarily always want things in a chronological order. They were guided by the Holy Spirit to write this down, and they didn't necessarily care about sequence of events. Sometimes sequence of events were more important. Things had to happen in a certain way, so... But what this mostly, in this part of the study, we've been in the last few, past few weeks, and we'll be in for the next few weeks, is we're looking at basically this middle portion uh, in the study. It actually says second year of Jesus' ministry, but I think that's a little confining when you start looking at what we're looking at. We're looking at this middle portion of Jesus' ministry. Um, Jesus' ministry, you know, the first part of it is generally what we call obscurity. You know, he's pretty obscure. He's He's gathering his uh, disciples. He's maybe calling these disciples. He's, he's 
doing things, but not on a grand scale. But then towards the second year, the middle part of Jesus' ministry, he starts to gain tremendous popularity. He, he starts to do miracles and open. People are following him. People are seeking him. That's what we're going to see this morning. Crowds are pushing in on him. He's feeding the multitudes. He's doing all these great miracles. He's calming the storm. He's, he's doing all these great things. And that's really what we call his popularity uh, there. And then, you know, after we get out of that, then we start to see him fall from that popularity. Now, this morning, you know, we're going to start to see kind of a shift towards the end of this passage um, in that how they view him. And but then, then kind of the line kind of gets drawn at the end of this passage between the Jews and Jesus and how that line is going to play out between the Pharisees. So there's a lot of things to look at this morning as we get into this. The first thing we look at this morning is the calling of Matthew. Now, only in the book of Matthew is he called Matthew. In uh, other, all the other Gospels, this is mentioned, he goes, it's called Levi. Now, that's not unusual in Jewish terminology. Simon was sometimes called Simon, sometimes called Peter sometimes called Cephas. So to have multiple names is not uncommon by any, in any standard. It's just not uncommon. And in the book of Matthew, he's called by that name Matthew. Now in the other Gospels, he's Levi. He's a tax collector, probably by a port, probably customs, what we would probably would call that today. Tax collectors were not, were very ill thought of because tax collectors in that day, paid their wages by charging extra tax. So all they could get out of you, they kept the extra. They give Caesar what was Caesar's, but they kept everything else, and they were known to be very corrupt. So tax collectors were always grouped in that group. Publicans, sinners, Gentiles, tax collectors, they were in that group of people. They weren't people that anybody really respected. They were people to look down on. If they were Jewish and a tax collector, they weren't allowed to, to, uh, they weren't allowed to do temple things. So they weren't actually allowed to go into the temple or do those things. They were excluded. So to be a tax collector puts you in a group that, of excommunication, actually, as a Jew. It, they looked at you the same way as a Gentile or a sinner. So they were grouped in that group. So it was a very big thing. So for a Jew to be a tax collector... You have to kind of wonder, you know, why and why Jesus called him. It's kind of an interesting, one of the more interesting, I think, choices that Jesus made to call a tax collector uh, to be an apostle or to follow him. Now, we haven't actually named apostles yet. I think that's, what, Matthew 10, Matthew, Matthew 10, I believe. Yeah, Matthew 10 is where he actually is going to say, these are my apostles. So he hasn't actually called out the twelve. So at this point, they're just disciples. So Jesus, you know, oftentimes we look at that, Matthew will be an apostle, but at the time that Jesus is calling him now, he's calling him as a disciple, not as an apostle, but as a disciple. So that's a little bit different, isn't it? Follow me. Isn't that Jesus' uh, signature uh, word? We don't know that he used that every time, but there's times he did. We know with Peter, he said, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Maybe to a broader group than Peter, right? Maybe that was Peter, Andrew, James. Maybe that was those fishermen that Jesus called. Maybe that was a wider call. Follow me. I don't know. But that was the idea. And maybe that's what he told all the others. Maybe this was something he said a lot. We don't have that recorded. But apparently there was something about the way he said it, something about who he was. We don't know the whole conversation. It's interesting that he would just walk up to somebody in a tax collector's booth and said, follow me, and he would get up and follow him. But maybe he didn't think he meant follow me from now on. Maybe he just meant follow me somewhere, follow me to do this. We don't know the context. We don't know what was going on in Matthew's mind, do we? But that's the call of Matthew. That's all we have, and it's, it's too bad we don't know more, but we don't know a lot about the call of Matthew. He got up and followed him. And as Jesus was reclining at the table in his house, because this kind of gives you the reason Matthew brings this up is because look who's in his house. You see, that's his group. And, and that's something for a Jew, that would be very unclean. That would be very wrong on all kinds of levels. Jesus was reclining at the table in the house. He's just called Matthew. Many tax collectors and sinners came were dining with Jesus' disciples. That's very uncool for a Jew. 
You just didn't do that. You didn't invite tax collectors. And you see how they're grouping. They're grouped right in that same, in that same group, right? Tax collectors and sinners. We group them together. So they're in that same grouping. Does that mean the Pharisees are non-sinners? No, but in their mind, they kind of thought that, didn't they? In their mind, they kind of thought they were non-sinners. They were righteous and maybe a little self-righteous, we know. But they were righteous, and they looked down upon other people. They judged their righteousness on other people. And so to them, if you were righteous, if you thought you were righteous and you were doing everything right, that made everybody else that wasn't you, it made them a sinner, right? You had put them in that category. And so Jesus, of course, we know, is often criticized for that. You associate with sinners. They were dining, which is a really big thing, to eat with them. Not just to be with them, but to eat with them. You've got to remember, Jews wouldn't even go into the house of a Gentile. They wouldn't go into the house of a tax collector. So why are the Pharisees there? What's the deal with that? If they wouldn't go into that group and wouldn't associate with that, then why does it say... The Pharisees saw this. They said to his disciples, were they outside of the house looking in the window? Were they? A lot of scholars think that probably what Matthew's doing here is he's kind of summarizing a trend. Does that make sense? In other words, the Pharisees, we're not necessarily maybe talking about one meal, one setting, and then the Pharisees saying, well, look at that. You know, look at him in that house right now. This is more of a generalized idea. The Pharisees knew he was doing it. This wasn't uncommon for Jesus to do it. So a lot of people think that the Pharisees, when it says the Pharisees saw this, we get, it's not just that they saw this time, like I saw you at the restaurant today. They saw it. They observed Jesus doing these things. The Pharisees were always around. They were always looking at him, studying him, trying to figure out what he was. The Pharisees knew when he went into these houses, out of these houses. A lot of scholars think that Matthew was basically not just saying the Pharisees saw this, this specific instance, this specific Matthew. Was Matthew even in the house? I don't know. You know, he called Matthew, and then it says, uh, as Jesus was reclining at the table in the house, I don't know if Matthew, I don't know if we're even talking about the same situation here. We don't, you know, I don't know that. We, we're, we're speculating if we say that. We don't know for fact that this was even immediately after he called Matthew. This could be a, you know, a different unrelated event. So that's what I mean. Sometimes we look at it, we're trying to think chronologically. Some things aren't real chronological. You always kind of got to hold it in the back of your mind. What's the writer trying to convey? What's Matthew trying to convey? Not is he being accurate with the time and accurate with the line. All these events happen. Now what's Matthew trying to convey with this event? He's trying to convey to you that Jesus called a tax collector, number one. This is kind of the start of it. He's trying to convey to you that Jesus ate with tax collectors and sinners, number two, that he spent time with them. And he's trying to convey to you that the Pharisees weren't ignorant of what was going on. So the Pharisees come to his disciples, not apostles yet, right? Come to his disciples and ask them, why is your teacher, and that's a word we talked about here, Jesus is often referred to, and this is kind of a more abstract terminology, teacher, rabbi. Why is your teacher, and that's not uncommon, because disciples, Jews would disciple themselves to teachers, like Caiaphas. They would disciple themselves to him, and he would be their teacher, their rabbi. So it wasn't uncommon for these uh, disciples, people who wanted to learn about God, people who wanted to learn about Judaism. It wasn't uncommon for them to join themselves to these teachers. Matter of fact, Paul said he was raised at the feet of Gamal. So it wasn't uncommon for them to do that. And so this isn't an uncommon, this isn't really this huge uncommon thing, but this rabbi, this teacher, is teaching a lot of different things, and he's eating with tax collectors and sinners. And instead of the Pharisees coming to Jesus and saying, why do you do that? They come to his disciples and say, why does he do that? And that's an interesting idea as we look at this text. Why did they ask them instead of asking Jesus? Well, I don't know. But Jesus heard about it. It's one of those things that it got around to him, right? He sees it. They talk to him. And then it gets, he gets around back to him, right? And Jesus says, it's not those who are healthy who need a physician, 
but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. This is the passage out of Isaiah. And um, it's a passage we need to look at just a little bit. Go and learn what this means. Hold on one second. I want to try to get my head on this for a second. When Jesus says that to them in this particular passage, sometimes we look at this or an either or situation. I don't know why I'm having a hard time finding what I'm looking for here, but nevertheless, we often look at this as an either or situation. I take that back. This is out of Hosea 6 6. Hosea 6 6 is the Old Testament passage for this, not Isaiah. And so he looks at this. We often look at this passage as an A or B situation. Maybe you call it an X or Y situation. In other words, it's like saying, I desire compassion, but I don't desire sacrifice. That's an A, B type deal. In other words, I desire A, but I don't desire B. And sometimes to read that text, we see that this way. I desire compassion. In other words, I want you to be compassionate to people. I want you to care about people. I want you to love people. Jews, of course, were big on sacrifice. And, of course, as New Testament Christians, we're commanded to make sacrifice in our way. So it's an A or B, but it's not. What, basically, in the original language, in the somatic of this text, somatic, with the way we look at this, the wording in this, is that I desire B more than A, not I desire B and not A. In other words, I desire, I desire sacrifice, but I desire compassion first and foremost. So it's not an it's not a this or that. It's more, more of this and that, if that makes sense. So sometimes when we look at that, people often bring this passage up. And the reason I'm kind of talking about this passage is because sometimes people bring this up or brought it up to me that it's, uh, you know, we're no longer required. To, he doesn't desire our sacrifice, which, of course, that's an unbiblical idea. We know that he does. We can make sacrifice to Christ, you know, to God, the fruit of our lips. Romans 12, 1 talks about sacrifice. So, so we're not 12, 1 and 2, Romans 12. So we're not saying that he doesn't require sacrifice. He does require sacrifice. He does desire sacrifice. But he desires compassion above that. So it's more of the compassion, less of the sacrifice. In other words, that's where the emphasis should be is on the compassion. I did not come to call the righteous but sinners. And that's kind of a wrong term in a way too. But to them, the point he's trying to make, it makes sense. I did not come to save you because you think you're already saved, right? But I came to call those who weren't. So it, when we look at that passage, that's what he's trying to get them. But he tells them, he says, go and learn what this means. That's how he starts it. Learn what this means. Learn what this passage out of Hosea, this Old Testament passage, Learn what it means, because you're not doing it right. You need to understand that I desire, I want more compassion. I still want the sacrifice, still commanding you to sacrifice, but you're all about the sacrifice, and I'm wanting you to be all about the compassion. Jesus said to them, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? So in other words, now we're back to the fasting question, Right? So he goes through this, learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. Not an A or B, not saying I desire compassion, but I don't desire sacrifice. That's not the somatic of the passage in the original especially. It's the idea that I desire compassion first. I desire more compassion. I desire that more than I desire sacrifice, but both those are still commanded. And then he gets down to this point. He says, but I'm here for the, for the uh, sinners, right? 
And then he gets back to the original question. Why doesn't he fast? So in the middle of this, almost in a parenthetical idea, we have this where he talks about the physician. And then he gets back to the original question. Jesus said to them, the attendance of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? So in other words, they don't fast because I'm here. If I wasn't here, then they would fast. And we're going to talk about that uh, a little bit, that idea. And so he, uh, and so, uh oh, I went the wrong way. Hold on, what am I doing? What did I do, Shannon? Where am I at? Okay. The bridegroom, the tenants of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with him, can they? But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. So this idea is as long as I'm there, they're not going to. But when I leave, they will. So is Jesus saying we shouldn't fast? No, he's saying they will fast. He's saying they're going to fast. But he says as long as I'm with them, they won't. So he's answering that question. Then he goes into this other idea about the unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Um, no one puts a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch falls away from the garment and a worse tear results. Now I know nobody hardly patches clothes anymore. So that might not mean a lot to a lot of people today, but when I was a kid, my granny patched everything we had multiple times. So I kind of know what that means. And when she did that, she would always try to find a comparable piece of cloth to patch it with because she didn't want, she wanted them to shrink at the same time. Otherwise, they would tear away. Nor do people put new wine into old wineskins. And I know that's something we don't do either, but you understand the principle. The wineskins burst because they won't stretch, right? The wine pours out. And the wine skins are ruined because that, because that stretches. But they put new wine into fresh wine skins, and both are preserved. While I was saying these things, a synagogue official came. Now, why does he say that? What does that have to do with what we're talking about? He says, as long as the teacher's with them, right, they don't fast. You don't put an old patch on a new garment. You don't put new wine into old skins. What does this have to do with what we're talking about? Jesus is talking here in, in this context, talking about the idea that he's the teacher. Why does your teacher do that? Why is this a new thing? Because Jesus is saying that you don't put them in an old garment. Now think about who Jesus is choosing to be his disciples. He's choosing men that are they're not ingrained in the theology of Judaism, right? He didn't go and pick the priests and the, the head of the Jewish people to try to teach. They just called him a teacher to try to put things into because he knew <clears throat> that that probably wouldn't work. Why? Because their heart was hard. Their heart was hard to what they had do. They were ingrained in their ways, ingrained in their tradition, ingrained in their upbringing. Those things were so important to them that if Jesus tried to put new teaching into that, it wouldn't work. So what did Jesus do? He went and got men who were still flexible, still pliable, still able to teach, right? Why does your teacher not adhere to our tradition? Is really what they're saying. Why doesn't he adhere to our tradition? Why don't, why don't you fast? Why doesn't he fast? Why is he different? Well, basically Jesus is saying to them, he says, you probably won't understand it. Because you're so steeped in your tradition, you're so steeped in your sacrifice, isn't that what we've talked about before, compassion and sacrifice? You're so set in all that that you're not going to accept it. It's not going to, you're going to, it's going to ruin, your, ruin you, in other words. It's going to tear the original garment or break that old skin because this is new. Uh, this isn't going to work. So there's a lot of things that you're probably not going to get. You're not going to understand. He's... <coughs> making that play to them, that idea that you need to, you know, that's why I didn't bring it to you. That's probably why you're not going to understand it. So Jesus has this conversation. So we start with this tax collector booth with Matthew. We start with eating with sinners. We go into this, this conversation, uh, you know, why does he eat with sinners? 
Uh, you're not going to understand that. Why doesn't he fast? You're not going to understand that. Uh, because you're old, you're steeped in your tradition, you're not open to new ideas or new things or new ways, and, and it doesn't make sense for you that I would do this, but because you don't understand, you're not going to understand that, you're not going to warm up to this for the most part because it's not really who you are, and that's why I'm doing this. This is fresh skins, this is fresh people, these are the sinners, these are the people that are going to respond to my message, to respond to what I have to tell them. When he tells the Pharisee that you're not righteous, the Pharisee doesn't scoffs at him, doesn't believe him. Huh, you're the unrighteous one. You don't fast. You don't. You eat with sinners, right? But when he tells the sinner that I've come to save you, I've come to forgive your sins, I've come to so that you can have an inclusion in this life, and I've come to give you grace and mercy, they receive that because they know that they need it. It's really hard to convert somebody who doesn't know they're lost. I guess is the easiest way to put this. If you've ever tried to convert someone who thinks they're not lost, you're never going to do that because they don't think they need to be saved and they'll drown that way. It's easy, a lot easier to convert someone and the only people you convert are people that, number one, come to the idea, come to the realization that they're lost, that they need Jesus Christ. If people don't come to that realization, you'll never convert them. People have to come to the realization that they're in a lost state and they need Christ. They have to be new, open to that. A person who says, oh, I've already got it. I don't need that. I've got it all figured out. You're not going to reach that person because they're closed to that. They're old skins. They're old garments. You're not going to see that. So there's a lot of idea, a lot of ideology in this passage and how you look at it. The two groups that he's talking to, the sinners, the tax collectors, and the Pharisee. So Jesus, so now we're going to kind of shift to Jairus' daughter. Now here, in Matthew, it doesn't give the name Jairus, but in Mark and Luke it does. While they were saying these things to them, a synagogue official, is what it says here, came and bowed down before him and said, my daughter has just died. This is another thing synoptically we struggle with. Uh, the other one said that she doesn't say that she's dead. If you look at uh, Mark and Luke, it doesn't say that she's died. It says that she's ill. In the Greek, it's uh, at the point of death, basically. That's a little bit different idea. So a lot of people look at that and say, well, why is there a discrepancy? Well, there really isn't. Um, we're not in a modern age, not in a modern idea. Uh, he's had to travel to get there. Maybe in his opinion, by now she had died. Like I said, the Greek is kind of, is really a close thing. It's here between... Uh, Matthew and Mark and Luke, the Greek's really close. It's like, I can't tell you the exact wording because I'm not really a Greek scholar, but I looked at it last night. But it's, it's uh, basically is at the point of death and at the point of just dying. So it kind of plays on the words, how you look at it. So, so she's at the point of death. And in Matthew, it says she's died. Now, whether there's more information here, she has died, whether this is just how he terms it, we don't know. But it's not really... It, we look at that oftentimes when we're looking across Gospels and we say, well, that's a contradiction, you know. How can it be true if there's a contradiction? But we're probably looking at it a lot closer than what we should. Um, I think the point is, whether you say she's at the point of death or she's died, there's a big thing, big difference here, but in the end of the story, I don't think it's going to matter that much because as we'll, we'll talk about that. You know, is this going to matter in the end result? Or not. You know, as Matthew looking at this, the others are like, he comes and my daughter's just about at the point of death, right? My daughter's about to take her last breath. <clears throat> Let's look at the whole story before we judge it. <clears throat> he says, uh, Jesus got up and began to follow him, and so did his disciples. This is different from the centurion where Jesus has healed, healed the servant from a distance, right? He's actually going to go. So his disciples, and here we're called disciples, and there were probably a lot of them, right? Jesus just chose 12, but that doesn't mean there were only 12 disciples. There were a lot of disciples. Jesus just chose 12 of them to be apostles. So this entourage is with him, because like I said, his popularity is growing. And a woman who had been suffering from a hemorrhage for 12 years <coughs> came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. Now, 
She's not at the point of death probably. She's been suffering for 12 years. That's a long time. Matthew doesn't give us as detailed a look at this as Mark and Luke do. And we don't really have time to go to all the other Gospels and read this out. But if you remember right, if you read this, and you probably have in other Gospels, it says she'd spent all she had, right? In other words, she was at the end of her rope. And Matthew doesn't give us that. That's how come it's so important to look at things across all three, what we call all three synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now, John isn't included in that. John's a little bit different. So, as a matter of fact, there's no parables in John. And there's a lot of differences in John. So, so Matthew, Mark, and Luke are synoptics. These are where these stories generally occur. Now, occasionally one of these will pop up, pop up in John, occasionally. But John kind of had a different agenda. So... When we look at this across these other Gospels, that's what we're going to say. It's going to say, she had spent all she had. In other words, she had done everything that she could to, to, to heal this disease, to heal this illness. She had gone as far as she could go. This was her last. The other Gospels kind of give you the idea, this is the last hope. This is our last hope. And she almost has a little bit of, of mysticism in this, isn't it? If I just touch his garment. Why does she think that? You know, where does she get that? Do we see any other place in any other gospel in any other story where, and then, you know, not getting into Acts, or stay out of Acts, because you get into Acts, you're going to get this where they took stuff and they carried it to them and they got well, but let's stay out of Acts. Let's just stay in the gospels. So in the gospels, do we really see that any place else? If I touch him, if I touch his garment, now Jesus touched people at times, right? He made salves, touched their eyes, right? Put it on their eyes, uh, spit, touched them. That really wasn't very social distancing, was it? <laughs> he touched them, and, he, and he, he did that, but not always, right? Didn't always do that, did he? He didn't always touch them to heal them. That was something sometimes he did, sometimes he didn't. In the case of the centurion servant, he wasn't even... In the wasn't even there. He did that from a distance. He wasn't even there to do it. So why do you think she wanted, why do you think she had convinced herself that if I touch him, why all of a sudden does this come up? Why did she convince herself if I touch his cloak? I kind of thought about that a little bit because I thought that's kind of, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? Touch and actually, if you really look at this in the original language, it's touch the hem of his garment. In other words, she wasn't saying, like, grab a hold of it. She was basically, if I can just touch the hem, touch the bottom of his garment. And I've always thought, you know, here's all these people, right, this crowd around Jesus, and Jesus is going. And if he was ever a little bitty kid, well, I know he's all little bitty kids. If you remember when you was a little bitty kid, let me rephrase that, and you were small and you wanted to get somewhere in a crowded room, right? How did you do that? You went between people's legs, right? I mean, that was the best way. You couldn't crowd through the top if you were little, but you could get on your hands and knees or whatever, and you could go between people's legs. They might not like it, but you could definitely get from point A to point B doing that. And I always thought about her thinking that. If I can just, you know, I can't get to him. You know, I'm a woman. Number one, I'm a woman. Number two, I'm unclean because I've got a hemorrhage. <clears throat> so in Jewish thought, that makes her unclean. So she's got two things going against her. She's a woman, she's unclean, and there's all these disciples, these men around Jesus, crowding in around Jesus. So she's thinking, how can I get his attention? Well, you know, Bartimaeus stayed on the side of the road, didn't he? Have mercy on me, son of Davis. He, David, he cried out. Bar, uh, Bartimus did, old blind Bartimus. He cried out, didn't he? Nicodemus, Jesus saw him in a tree. Am I right? Why did Jesus see people? Why did, uh, he come, why did it come to their attention? Well, I don't know all the time. The man at the pool of Bethesda, why did he pick him out? Out of all the people that were around the pool of Bethesda, was he the most miserable one there? I don't know. I don't know why Jesus picked people out and said, you know, I see you. A lot of times people beseeched him, didn't they? Came to him. Jairus came to him. Come heal my daughter. The centurion sent to him. Come heal my servant. 
So a lot of times people would come and ask him, but a lot of times Jesus would just randomly see people, randomly do things. She had to get his attention, didn't she? Uh, she had to let him know, how is she going to do that? And in my mind, I'm always thinking, she's going to crawl through this, the legs of this crowd. She's basically going to be in the dirt. This is just Rex's idea. You can have your own. And she thinks, if I can just get a hold of his hem, the hem of his garment, the bottom of his garment, that's what the hem is, right? And in the original, that's what it says, the hem of his garment. If I can just get a hold of the bottom of his garment, then I'll be healed. Why, what was her basis for that assumption? Had somebody else been healed by touching him? By touching, just touching him? I don't know. We don't have record of it. Had she heard that somewhere? If you can just get close enough and touch him, you'll be healed? I don't know. I don't have a clue. I don't know why she thought that. But she thought, if I can just touch it, if I can just touch him like a talisman, like, like a magic deal, if I can just get a hold of him, I'll be healed. But you know, the funny thing was, she was, wasn't she? Matter of fact, this is probably the worst gospel to look at this story. Matter of fact, if you look at the other gospels, it says that Jesus felt that go out of him, right? And he said, who touched me? Jesus uh, felt that c come out of him. So it did work, didn't it? It did work. Just in that touching, but do was, but was she healed? This is the question. This is the question. Was she healed because she just touched the hem of his garment, or was she healed because she had faith that if I just touch him, I'll be healed? That's the question, right? Because if she just was healed by touching the hem of his garment, then anybody that came in contact with him or that he brushed up against would be healed. That's kind of an interesting thought, isn't it? Um, you know, in Judaism... They thought that, and he well, in a lot of Catholicism too, they think that uh, relics have power. And they get that out of the Old Testament. Actually, because when the, they were hurting from the marauders, I can't remember that exact passage, in Kings, and they threw, the, and they threw him into the, to the tomb, and he touched the bones of Ezekiel, or Elisha, and he came back to life. That Old Testament story, that there was power in those dead bones. And the Catholic Church, of course, used that for years as they sold relics, the idea there's power in these sacred articles. And if you just touch them or hold them or have them in your house, they're like a talisman, and they're going to give you power. But I don't think she was healed because of the garment, because she touched him. Because I don't think everybody, I don't think in the Gospels, I don't think you can support the idea that everybody that touched Jesus was healed. But I think you can get support the idea that it was her faith that healed her. She had faith that if she did that, she would be healed. And that's kind of an interesting thought, right? Matter of fact, Jesus says it exactly, doesn't he? He says, take courage. Your faith has made you well. But then listen to what it says. At once the woman was made well. If you take all three of the Gospels together on this and put them side by side, I would encourage you to do that. It gives you a better story than what you just get out of Matthew. But it's an interesting story. It's one that has always meant a lot to me. This woman who was so desperate that it was her last chance. He was her last hope. And, and in that desperation, she went to just touch the hem of Jesus' garment. It's that idea of just getting the crumbs from the master's table. I just want you to pay attention to me for one second. And in that, she was healed. What an amazing story. And then Jesus gets to the official's house, of course not named in Matthew, Jairus' house. The flute players and the crowd in noisy disorder. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen a New Orleans funeral, but there's something to see. But in New Orleans, if you're rich, I guess they still do this. I know they did. Used to do it. If you're really rich in New Orleans and you die, what you do is you hire whalers, mourners, and you pay them. Have you ever seen those old shows? Well, have you ever watched James Bond? Uh, what's that James Bond movie with Solitaire where he's in New Orleans? Anyway, if you ever watched that movie, you know, and you see at the beginning of that movie and they're going down and they're playing the trumpets and they're going down Bourbon Street and there's a coffin and they're carrying it and there's all these people wailing. All You know, they call them wailers, uh, mourners. And they're just putting on a show. They're all dressed in black and boy, they're crying and, and they're paid to do that. They pay them. There's people that actually get paid, I guess they still do, I don't know, in New Orleans, to be mourners. And if you're really rich, the richer you are, the more mourners you have. Well, in Judaism, at the time of Jesus, even the very poor 
it was customary for you to at least hire two flute players and one mourner. So this guy's pretty rich. He's a synagogue official. So these players and crowd, a lot of these are hired. These are hired people. They've hired him to come in. She's died, and this kind of attests to her death. So they hire him to come in and mourn and come in and play this flute. And like I said, even the poorest people at the time of Jesus, you're, you were almost, it was almost expected for you to hire two flute players and one whaler, one mourner, when somebody died. Well, he's got a lot. So there's disorder. Because if you ever see him, they can really put it on. You know, I mean, they're really crying. They really cry. They really, it's amazing. I mean, you ought, you ought to watch some of that. YouTube it. You'll, everything's on YouTube, right? And he said, leave, for the girl has not died, but is asleep. And they began laughing at him. So whether or not the other gospels say she was at the point of death, and Matthew says she had died, and the end of this story is irrelevant. Because when Jesus gets there, she's dead. She's not asleep. She's dead. They're already mourning. They're already doing their mourning, which, which like I said, that's a Jewish custom. And they began laughing at him when the crowd had been sent out he entered and took her by the hand, and the girl got up, and the news spread throughout all the land, and Jesus went on from there. Two blind men followed him. Now this story, we're almost out of time. This story, some scholars say, is a doublet. It has to do with the other healing of the blind men in the book of Matthew. Some people think it's an entirely different story. I don't know that it matters. Um, he entered the house. A blind man came up to him. Jesus said to them, Do you believe I'm able to do this? And they said to him, Yes, Lord. And he touched their eyes. This is the case where he touched them. It shall be done to you according to your faith. Now, as we get to the end of this class this morning, I think it's important for us to understand that, you know, these miracles, especially the woman who touched the hinge of his garment and the guys on the eyes, that was really a faith, right? I guess Jairus had faith that he went and got Jesus and had the faith that Jesus could heal his daughter or raise him from the dead. So we're not all miracles really had faith involved. Some miracles were just miracles, and it really wasn't faith. Is this in this next three? Because we had three before this, three before this of Matthew. Then we have this three, and in this three, we're really looking at this idea of faith playing a part in these healings. And that's, that's like I said, that's not always the case, but in these, it is the case. People, and why is that? Because Matthew's moving us towards the idea that people were beginning to believe, have faith, that Jesus could do it. He's moving us. He's, what's the writer's intent? Right? And this intent, he's moving us to the idea that people are really beginning to have faith in Jesus. That's how come I think he brings us up in these three miracles specifically. Because of what he's fixing to tell us here. Um, their eyes were open. Make sure no one knows. Of course they did. Uh, and they were going out, a mute demon-possessed man was brought to him. After the demon was cast out, the mute man spoke. The crowds were amazed and were saying, nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. So now we have a healing here that says what? The, the, the demon-possessed man couldn't have had faith, right? Uh, he was demon-possessed. So now we look at a little different miracle, but then we look at this power over demons. So Matthew is building up this picture of Christ and this Pharisees were saying he cast out demons by the ruler of demons and we've talked about that before and so as he gets down as we get to this point and that's the shift the line's been drawn in the sand right now the Pharisees are on one side and everybody else seems to be on the other the Pharisees have drawn the line they're not denying his power. They're not denying his ability. They're not denying that he can cast out demons. They're not denying that he can heal because it's obvious. There's no denying it. So now they have to deny the source of his power. You know, this is the, the building of this uh, through the Gospels and through the popularity of Jesus is what we're looking at now. As he becomes more and more popular with the populace, he becomes less and less popular with the Jewish hierarchy, with those in power. Because the teachings of Jesus and their teachings seem to be kind of irreconcilable. But, of course, we understand that that's not the case. Um, hope you got something out of this this morning, a lot of text uh, to look at. And we'll be back with you here in just a, just a few minutes. Oh. Huh? 
Hi, Samuel and Abe. Boy, I miss our little kids. Uh, I miss you little kids more than you could possibly imagine. So thank you, Samuel and Abe. Hi to you too this morning. I'm glad you're watching us. Okay. <laughs>